So chapter two is neuroscience and the biology of behavior. Hold on tight. This is a lot of information. Uh, each chapter is pretty much just the summarized version of each, each of the classes that you are able to take at Northwestern or somewhere else. Another, another um, realm of psychology, another aspect of psychology, whether it's uh, social psychology, biopsychology, cognitive psychology, um, this is general psychology. So you're getting a snippet of each type of aspect of psychology. So uh, I'm going to try to fit as much as I can into this chapter two, into this lecture video. So hang on tight. It's a lot of information. Email me if you have any questions over it. Uh, let's get into chapter two. So first off, what is neuroscience? Neuroscience is this field devoted to the study of the nervous system and the brain. Uh, biopsychology, which is a class you can take and is uh, a field of psychology, is uh, a field within neuroscience that focuses on the scientific study of the biological basis of behavior and mental processes. So the, how the brain functions, how, um, how the brain uh, creates thoughts and feelings and beliefs and how that then transfers into behaviors. So a breakdown of the nervous system, we're going to start off with the neuron, the most basic uh, level of the nervous system. That is basically a nervous system cell. A neuron is a tiny excitable cell that receives stimulation and transmits information to other neurons throughout the body. So this is a cartoon drawing of a neuron. So uh, to break that down, we've got parts of the neuron. We've got the dendrites which are these branch-like things here. And those are uh, responsible for receiving information from other neurons. Uh, so we'll talk about how neurons communicate with one another. So this receives information and then this, then neurons down here pass them on to the next neuron. The soma, which is this whole the biggest part is the body of the neuron. It contains a nucleus, which is right here, which houses the cell's genetic information. It, it tells it um, how are you going to form and um, in which way are you going to form. And then the axon, which is this long thing right here, it's, the, it's a part of the neuron um, that is responsible for carrying information to the end of the neuron so that it can then uh, transfer information to the next neuron. Then we have the myelin sheath right here. And this is a fatty layer that covers the axon that helps um, protect the axon and then actually helps speed up the transmission of information down the axon. It kind of jumps uh, down so it gets to skip um, some travel time. And here I, I put two neurons together so you can kind of see how dendrites communicate with one another. Um, through terminal buttons. These are located at the end of each neuron and they contain vesicles, which I'll get into what vesicles are later, holding the neurotransmitter, which I'll also talk about later, which is released into the synapse during an action potential. Okay, that was a lot of information right there. Uh, I'm gonna talk about soon what an action, action potential is, what a neurotransmitter, what a vesicle, and what a synapse, what all those are. So an action potential is the communication from neuron to neuron. It's a brief electrical charge that travels down the neuron. It's a neural impulse and they are all or nothing, which means uh, if it gets a little jolt of electricity, uh, but not enough to, um, to send it down the neuron, then it's not gonna happen at all. Um, it's all or nothing. It's either going to be a little bit of a charge and then it goes back to its resting state, or it's going to be enough of a charge to then trigger this electrical impulse to happen to go down the axon through to the next neuron. Um, so the resting potential is about negative 70 millivolts. Um, and that's, that's just where the, the neuron is at its resting state. So it's more uh, negatively charged on the inside of the cell and more positively charged on the outside of the cell. And then um, after an action potential happens, so after one neuron communicates with the next neuron, there's what's called a refractory period, which is where uh, the cell is kind of recouping and getting back to its resting state. And during that time, an action potential cannot occur. And this seems like a lot of stuff to happen. So this, this must take, you know, 
hours to happen or this at least several minutes to happen. No, this is happening milliseconds. You know, our brains, neurons are constantly firing and communicating with one another. So this, these, um, the action potentials, the resting uh, period, the, the refractory period, all of these happen in just the shortest amount of time. Um, it's, it's amazing that we even know how these work. It happens so quickly. So I know this picture is a little blurry, but this is uh, the demonstration of an action potential. So here at about negative 70 millivolts, we've got just the, the neuron is at rest. And we have a few failed initiations of um, some kind of stimulus, um, whether it's pain or whether it's a thought or whether it's we want our body to move, whatever it is. Um, if we don't have enough of a positive charge to the cell, well, then it's just going to go back to its resting state and nothing's going to happen. However, if it crosses the threshold of negative 55 millivolts, then um, whether it's, you know, goes from negative 70 to negative 55. And so it's just an, a positive 15 charge. That's all it takes. It doesn't matter if it's positive 15, positive 30, positive 100. As long as it hits the negative 55 millivolts, um, that is enough for it to boom for the one neuron to communicate, um, send an impulse down to the next. And that's called depolarization. And then as it, as the um, cell starts to come back down to normal, it's called repolarization. And then down here where it's more negatively charged than at its resting state, it's trying to recoup. That's the refractory period. And then the cell goes back to its resting state, ready to possibly undergo another action potential. And um, how 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 neurons communicate with one another is across the synapse, which is just a little gap uh, between between neurons. So here you can see a little gap between the neurons, and that is where um, where they communicate. Um, so that's a small space between the presynaptic neuron, which is the neuron before the synapse. And the postsynaptic neuron, which is a neuron after the synapse, and they become filled with neurotransmitters after an action potential. And so these neurotransmitters are traveled down um, at the end of the, the neuron, the at the presynaptic neuron, they're filled, um, they are they are they fill vesicles, um, which we see right here. So here's neurotransmitters. So Let's say this is um, serotonin. Um, so serotonin is within this vesicle. This is the presynaptic neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. Here's some receptors that are waiting for serotonin to, to bind to it. So whenever an action potential occurs, it's telling an, an, a neuron to do something, to send a signal down to the next one, down to the next one, and telling our body to do something. So it's releasing the vesicles open and release and neurotransmitters cross the synapse onto the postsynaptic neuron. And then whenever it's it's over, then um, the what happens is called reuptake. So the receptors let go of the serotonin or whatever neurotransmitter we're talking about and gets re is reup taken into the presynaptic neuron back into these vesicles. And so that's how neurons communicate with one another through electrical pulses that sends neurotransmitters um, through synapse between neurons, uh, which then bind to receptors, which then um, communicate what that neuron is supposed to do. Okay, so we have several types of neurotransmitters to talk about. We have acetylcholine, which is responsible for arousal, which is, you know, being awake, attention, memory, muscle contractions. Dopamine is important for feelings of pleasure, learning, memory, movement. Serotonin is um, also important for arousal and for your ability to sleep and for your mood stability and for appetite. Um, if any of you guys are on any antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications, it could be an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it would prevent, it would, it would keep serotonin on these receptors and keep it from being brought back up into the presynaptic neuron just a little um, psychopharmacology for you. Uh, norepinephrine um, is responsible for alertness and arousal and mood. Uh, 
gamma amino butyric acid uh, is sleep and inhibits movement. And this is also known as GABA. Uh, that's what pretty much everyone calls it is GABA. And um, this is kind of like the downer. This is one that brings you back down and um, helps you relax. Uh, glutamate is important for learning and memory and synaptic plasticity, which is um, basically their ability to adapt. And then endorphins block pain signals, produce feelings of pleasure, regulates the immune system and system dysfunction. So neurotransmitters are very, very important and they have a lot of jobs. So, um, Whenever you uh, take any kind of drug, um, whether it is prescribed or or legal or illegal, whatever it whatever it is, um, they can fall under two categories: an agonist or antagonist. So, an agonist is a neurotransmitter or drug that binds to cell receptors and produces a biological response. So, it causes something to happen. It causes um, your neurons to interact with one another, to communicate with one another. And one example is nicotine. Um, but then there's antagonists. If you think of, you know, the antagonist in a story, it prevents things from happening. So it's a neurotransmitter or, or a drug that binds to cell receptors and blocks the effects of another substance. So whenever, uh, let's talk for instance, caffeine. So um, whenever you are feeling sleepy, there is a neurotransmitter that is binding to receptors that makes you feel sleepy. But what caffeine does, you know, we think, oh, caffeine makes us stay awake, makes us stay awake. What it does is it blocks those receptors uh, from binding with that neurotransmitter uh, that makes you sleepy. And so it blocks it, it's an antagonist and it prevents you from feeling sleepy because of, um, because it blocks the neurotransmitter from, uh, binding to the receptor site. And so um, whenever you consume more and more caffeine, you can build up your tolerance. Um, and so, you know, maybe one cup used to affect you so much and now it takes three cups to keep you awake. It's because your brain uh, continues to make more of these receptors for this sleepy neurotransmitter. And um, so it takes more caffeine to block all of those receptors. I hope that makes sense. And so what you're doing is you're telling your body, no, I don't want to feel sleepy. The more caffeine I, I take, the more, the more coffee, the more tea, the more, you know, energy drink, whatever it is, um, it's going to block all those receptors and prevent me from feeling sleepy. Um, and so one, another example of that is the botulism toxin. And so it blocks receptors in the brain um, on these neurons, which then causes all of your muscles to contract and you, um, it, it paralyzes them and in a contracted state. Um, so you, you can't unlock that, unlock your muscles. Okay. So a little bit of a review. Um, and just a reminder, this is, um, these are not questions for a grade or anything like that. Um, they are just to help review at the end of a section of a chapter. So number one, which part of the neuron improves the speed of the neural impulse? Which one is that? That would be B, the myelin sheath. Number two, what is the brief electrical impulse that travels down the axon called? How do you neurons communicate with one another? That'd be action potential. Number three, at its resting state, the outside of a neuron is more blank than the inside of the neuron. Hmm. The outside is more positively charged because remember the resting state of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts. And so whenever um, any kind of stimuli comes around, then the positive charge is going to flood the inside of the neuron and cause an electric impulse, the action potential to carry down the axon into the next neuron. Uh, number four, an action potential occurs when the inside of a cell becomes more blank charged and the blank charge moves down the axon. I just, I just said that. So the inside of a cell becomes more positively charged and the electrical charge moves down the axon. So that would be B. 
And number five, in the process of neurotransmission, the action potential causes the neurotransmitters to be released from the blank into the blank. It'd be from the synaptic vesicles, from those vesicles into the synapse. So it, then they would cross the synapse and bind to the receptors. So that would be D. Okay, now on to the nervous system. So what comprises the nervous system? We have uh, two branches of the nervous system. We have the central nervous system and the peripheral. So first, the, nerve, the central nervous system, also known as the CNS, is just the brain and the spinal cord and also contains these cells called glial cells, which just help support um, the neurons in the brain and in the spinal cord. So we see here in this picture, the, uh, the central nervous system is in pink. So it's the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have the peripheral nervous system, which is all of the body's nerves. So um, the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, carries information from the brain and the spinal cord uh, to and from various parts of the body, okay? So first off, we've got sensory or afferent neurons. These carry information toward the central nervous system from the sensory organs, such as eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and skin. And so, it's, you know, I see something and that's going to send a signal to my brain to process that information. So that's what um, my sensory or afferent neurons are doing. Then we have motor or efferent neurons, and these carry information away from the central nervous system in order to operate muscles and glands. So this is our brain and spinal cord telling our bodies what to do. You need to move your leg to walk. You need to swallow to swallow your food. Um, those are the motor neurons. They, they cause your body to do something. Your sensory neurons are telling your brain the information that you are receiving from the outside world. And then interneurons send information between sensory neurons and motor neurons, okay? Um, and then the peripheral nervous system is broken down into two more branches. We have the somatic and autonomic, not automatic, but autonomic nervous systems. So the somatic nervous system is uh, receives stimuli from the outside world, coordinates movements, and performs other tasks under conscious control. Then we have uh, the autonomic nervous system, which is the system responsible for involuntary functions of the internal organs of our bodies. So the somatic is um, we can we can control what we do. Uh, these are these are movements that um, that we decide whether or not we want to do things we decide we want to do. And then the autonomic is all the involuntary stuff, the functions that our body just does without us thinking about it. And then that's further broken down into two branches. And I'm sure you guys have heard of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And I'll tell you why in just a second. So the sympathetic nervous system is the branch of the autonomic nervous system responsible for the involuntary functions of the body's internal organs, particularly during times of stress. So that would be the, somat the sympathetic nervous system, which is a part of the autonomic nervous system, which is a part of the peripheral nervous system, is responsible for our flight or fight or flight response. So it's going to cause our pupils to diet to, uh, to constrict so we can see more clearly. It's going to cause, um, it's going to cause our, our internal organs to slow down because we don't need, um, we don't need energy going towards digestion when we might need to run away from a threat. Okay. It's going to cause, um, our heart rates and our, our respiration to increase. It's gonna send more oxygen to our body and give us more energy. And then there's the parasympath parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for returning our body back to its natural resting state. So after we've gone through, you know, some sort, sort of fight or flight response, uh, maybe you're being chased by a dog while you're, you know, on a walk. And so you start running and, you know, your, your body is being pumped full of adrenaline or, uh, norepinephrine, um, causing your body to uh, kind of give give its reserves to you, to give you energy to get through that, an extra burst. But then when it's done and uh, your body needs to return back to that that resting state, that's what the parasympathetic nervous system is for.
Okay, now on to the endocrine system. So that was the nervous system and the branches of the nervous system. Now on to the endocrine system, which is responsible for, responsible for all of our hormones. Hormones communicate throughout our whole entire body, tells it what to do. Um, so the endocrine system is a secondary and slower communication system in the body that involves hormones, which control most of our body's major functions. So endo means within and crin means secrete. So you're sec it's secreting hormones from within. And um, a lot of, a lot of, or several of our endocrine system organs are, uh, initiate in the brain. So what is a hormone? A hormone is a chemical messenger secreted by the glands into the bloodstream that regulates the activity of cells or organs. So what organs are uh, part of the endocrine system? Uh, sorry, this is a little blurry, but first we've got the pituitary gland that is in the brain. That is basically in the center of the brain. Um, and it's kind of blown up right there. It's in the center of the brain. And this is what's called the master gland. This is the one that tells pretty much all of the other glands what to do. Uh, there are so many different hormones that are secreted from the pituitary gland, which is just this tiny little thing inside our brains that, that controls so much of our body. Then we have the pineal gland, which is also inside the brain. It's this tiny little, um, uh, oh, sorry. It's it's this little little dot right here that um, connects both sides of our brains, um, our left side and our right side of our brain, and it's important for the wake and sleep cycle. Our thyroid gland, which is in our our neck right here, um, it's imp important for metabolism and for sensitivity, like skin sensitivity and things like that. Um, very, very, very important. Next, we have our pancreas, which I'm sure if you know anything about diabetes, you know that it has to deal with the pancreas um, because the pancreas regulates blood sugars. Uh, adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys, they are uh, responsible for stress response. So whenever we release adrenaline, also uh, called norepinephrine, uh, it's secreted from our adrenal glands. So we're, if we're in that fight or flight response, it's coming from our adrenal glands uh, that's why it's called adrenaline from on top of our kidneys. And then for um, males, they have uh, the testes and females, we have ovaries. And uh, those are the gonads and those are responsible for sexual development. Okay, number one, a drug like nicotine that produces a biological response in the brain is called a, or an, it's called an agonist, B. It causes something to happen. It doesn't prevent anything from happening. It causes something to happen. Number two, when you touch a hot stove and immediately withdraw your hand, it's called a blank and is the result of interneurons within the blank. We didn't really talk about reflexes, but that would be a reflex and interneurons aren't inside the brain. Um, so it would be reflex and spinal cord. Okay, uh, number three, chemical substances in the body that regulate bo bodily activities such as growth, metabolism, and sexual production are called D, hormones. Uh, number four, the endocrine system consists of many glands that release hormones for different functions. Which gland is considered the master gland that communicates with all the other glands? How many times can I say gland in one paragraph? That would be A, the pituitary gland. It is the master gland that communicates with all the others and tells them what to do. Okay, now on to how we study the brain. This is very important for the realm of psychology well, and, and neuropsychology um, because if we don't know how the brain functions, yeah, okay, it's fine if we know the anatomy of the brain, but what does that matter if we don't know what they do? So we I'm going to go through several different ways. I believe six different ways that um, we now in modern times can study the brain. The first is the computed tomograph scan, and that's also called a CT scan. This is a machine that takes a series of x-rays from many different perspectives, which is sent to a computer and that interprets the data and displays two-dimensional image of the structure. So this is what 
a CT scan of the brain would look like. Okay, next is magnetic resonance imaging, which is also called an MRI. Um, this is an imaging procedure that utilizes a large magnet to examine the structural aspects of the brain and organ or tissue. This is going to show things more like uh, blood vessels and tissue and things like that. So if you want a little bit more detailed of a look, um, I would go with an MRI over the CAT scan. So this is what some MRI images look like. Next is the electroencephalogram or also known as an EEG and this is a non-invasive technique to study the brain activity that measures electrical activity of the brain. So you'd wear this little helmet um, scalp type thing cap and it puts electrodes um, that touch your head which um, can measure the electric activity happening in our brain because remember action potentials um, are they are electrical impulses. So it's it's picking up on all those electrical impulses within our brains. Next is the magnetoencephalography. En this is called a MEG um, procedure that measures faint magnetic fields uh, generated by brain activity and provides precise information about brain activation and spatial location. That's a really weird looking. <laughs> <laughs> looking machine there. Um, I don't know much about MEGs. Um, I do know more about CAT scans and MRIs uh, and EEGs. Um, so this was this was new for me to, to learn about. Um, but what it does is it attracts the, the magnetic uh, charges in your brain and um, brings them to the surface of um, really the angle at which it's trying to get an image. And um, that's how it brings the images back to the machine. It's real interesting. Okay, next is positron emission tomography, also known as a PET scan. This is brain imaging technique that produces a three-dimensional image of the functioning of the brain. So it can show different parts of the brain that are basically lit up from activity, from brain activity. Next is a functional magnetic resonance imagery. So it's a functional MRI. This is a procedure that uses MRI technology to capture a picture of the brain in addition to measurement of brain activity. So we can see it's like, it looks like an MRI plus some things that are lit up uh, depending on what parts of the brain are being activated. Okay, that was all for the different ways that we can uh, study the brain and its activity. Now on to, okay, so what are the parts of the brain? What is the anatomy of the brain? So here we have the full brain right here, and I'm going to break the brain down into um, different parts. So first we've got the hind brain, which is these parts right here that are a different color. So we've got the pons, the medulla, the spinal cord, or the brainstem, and the cerebellum. So first, the pons, this weird looking egg-shaped thing right here, is important for arousal, sleeping, dreaming, and connecting to the upper part of the brain. The medulla uh, is responsible for breathing, heartbeat, coughing, vomiting, and swallowing reflexes. So all of these parts of the hind brain, they're responsible for the involuntary parts of our functioning. Um, if something happens to our hind brain, damage to it, um, it's it's not looking too good because if if we can't breathe, um, if we if we have to tell our our hearts to beat, um, if we can't swallow, um, we're not going to make it very very well. So um, this is really the they say it's the most primitive part of the brain, and that it's um, it's been around for the longest from an evolutionary standpoint. So this is. Um, the most, I would say the most important part of the brain in terms of basic survival. Next, uh, the cerebellum processes perceptions and motor movement. And cerebellum basically means little brain. And so it kind of looks like a miniature version of the brain. And um, so yeah, processes perceptions and motor movement. So if you have some kind of injury to the cerebellum, you may not be able to walk very well. Um, you would have very shaky motor movements. And then the brainstem um, has, 
It's responsible for incoming sensory information and outgoing motor commands and integrative functions. So that is your most, you know, um, all of, you know, we talked about all of the um, peripheral nervous system bringing uh, information to and from the central nervous system. Well, the brainstem is where it's all kind of gathered to go up to the brain and process the information. Um, so integrative functions critical for cardiovascular system control, respiratory control, pain sensitivity control, alertness, and consciousness. So very, very, very important. We do not want to take the hind brain lightly. Next, we've got the forebrain, which is this this whole thing right here that's all in purple. All of this. So um, part of the forebrain is the limbic system, which is all of this right in here. A set of brain structures responsible for a number of survival-related and emotionally driven behavior. This includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, basal ganglia, amygdala, and hippocampus. A lot of funny words right there. So I'm going to break it down by each of those pieces. So first we've got the thalamus. It's a structure located just above the brain stem right here that processes information incoming uh, incoming information and directs the messages to the appropriate areas of the cerebral cortex, which is all of this. When we think of the brain, this, this part right here of the brain. Next, the hypothalamus is a structure um, of the nervous system to, um, that that links the nervous system to the endocrine system and plays an important role in the regulation of biological drives, such as um, our desire to eat, our desire to mate, uh, things like that. The basal ganglia is a set of interconnected structures next to the thalamus that are an essential participant in motor control, cognition, different forms of learning, and emotional processing. Uh, the amyg amygdala structure involved in fear detection, aggression, and reward. And then the hippocampus um, is so important for memory. So if, if there's any kind of damage to the hippocampus, that's where amnesia and things like that can occur. So it's all this part of the brain. Okay, and then lastly, the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex is broken down into four types of lobes. So first we've got the occipital lobe, which is on the back right here. And this is important for visual processing. Then we've got the temporal lobes, which are where our temples are. Um, and those are important for auditory processing. Then we've got the parietal lobes, which are on either side right here. Um, those are imp important for processing and integrating sensory information related to taste, temperature, and touch. And then we've got the frontal lobe right here, um, which is responsible for integration and management functions. So I've got a picture right here, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. So we have the sulcus right here, which is basically um, a, a, a divot in the brain. And on either side, we've got these important cortexes. One of them is the somatosensory cortex, which receives and interprets information about bodily sensations. Um, so say you got a massage and um, on your back and or on your feet, it's, it's sending that kind of sensation information to the somatosensory cortex. Then the other one is the motor cortex. This generates the neural impulses that control the execution of movements. Okay, last slide. Um, just a brief, brief touch on behavioral genetics because um, this is so important in terms of um, understanding why just our DNA does not tell everything about us and who we're going to be and um, what we are capable of. So we know that uh, the, inf the hereditary information that we get from our parents um, forms our DNA. It forms um, the basis. It tells our cells what to do, uh, what kind of cells to be. Um, it says whether you're going to get blonde hair or brown hair or black hair or red hair, whether you're going to have blue eyes or green eyes or brown eyes or hazel eyes or gray eyes. It's going to tell you what kind of skin you're going to have. It's going to tell you how tall you're going to be. Um, but there are there is some leniency in there, and that's where the realm of epigenetics comes in. And that's the study of heritable changes in gene function that cannot be explained by any changes in the DNA, but likely involve environmental effects. So maybe you are exposed to something, whether it's a chemical, whether it's a situation, um, but it can have such a profound impact on you 
that it literally changes your DNA. And then that DNA is heritable down to your next generation. So your genes can change, not just from um, different people that mate with different people. It's because it can also be because of a product of your environment. Um, so that's how, how I wanted to wrap that into uh, psychology is um, the people you, you surround yourself with, the environments you are in, make sure that they are healthy because they can help determine who you are at a cellular level. Okay. And that changes your mental processes, um, which is the study of psychology, the study of mental processes. So that is where I want to leave chapter two. I'll see you next for chapter three. All right. Bye.